we still can't find the source of the mysterious signal we've been receiving since 2018. We receive it every 22 minutes, and nothing can explain this. Some scientists even believe it could be coming from another civilization we haven't met yet. This strange radio signal wasn't found by a scientist on a serious mission. It was actually discovered by a college student just doing a regular project for school. Tyrone O'Doherty, an undergrad student at Curtin University in Australia, was sifting through old data of the southern sky. He was looking for any weird blinking radio signals. He finally stumbled upon one from 2018 that seemed to shoot radio waves towards Earth like a lighthouse beam. Excited about his find, Tyrone shared it with his mentor, radio astronomer Natasha Hurley-Walker. She dove into researching this signal, hoping for a breakthrough. But despite checking different frequency data, they hit a dead end. But then, Natasha spotted a pattern. The signal repeated every 18 minutes. This was huge. But just as they were gearing up to study it further, poof, the signal vanished after only three months, leaving them with nothing. Not giving up, Natasha and her team scanned the skies again, desperate for a clue. Months passed, but nothing turned up. They were ready to give up, and then suddenly, a new signal popped up. This one kept blinking for five minutes, then it disappeared. And then it came back exactly 22 minutes later. The main question was if that signal was related to an 18-minute one. To figure it out, Natasha went back to the old radio data from that area. As they dug deeper, they realized that, yes, and these signals aren't anything new. They've been beaming towards Earth for 35 years. Back in 1988, Indian and American telescopes had caught them, but they got buried under tons of other data. This was great news for space explorers, because it meant they could now calculate how far away this mysterious object was. After doing the math, they figured out it was incredibly far, even on a space scale, 15,000 light-years from Earth. Now, the only thing left to uncover was what exactly this object was. Walker and his team started comparing it to all the known radio-emitting objects out there. Yet, its source remains a mystery. The signals still pop up every 22 minutes on NASA screens, always ending with a frustrating match-not-found message. The scientists called it J183910. Some think that the signal might come from some extraterrestrial beings. Maybe it's the signal that SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, has been waiting for. This project has been working for over 50 years, trying to find any evidence of life beyond Earth. They also scan the skies for radio waves, laser pulses, and other mysterious signals. So, maybe it's a way for extraterrestrial folk to communicate their location. While that idea may sound exciting, we need to be careful about jumping to conclusions. First, we don't have solid proof for that. Before any concrete evidence, it's just speculation. And also, there are other more plausible explanations. Most likely, it comes from a natural phenomenon, and there are a couple of theories for that. The first one is the pulsar theory. Imagine a huge star in space much bigger than our sun. Sometimes these big stars finish their life journeys in a spectacular event called a supernova. When this happens, the star's core collapses, becoming super compact as if you're squeezing all the stuff from that star into a tiny space. That tiny, super-dense core is called a neutron star. Some of these neutron stars are extra special. We call them pulsars. They get their name because they seem to pulse with energy, like a space lighthouse. These pulsars have incredibly strong magnetic fields, much stronger than what you'd find on Earth. They're like enormous magnets in space. Because of this, they shoot out beams of energy. They're also spinning super fast, so these beams of energy seem to pulse on and off as they spin around. Now, the strange signal we detected seems to have similarities with pulsars, but not quite. Pulsars usually have a predictable lifespan and slow down over time. 
eventually stopping their radio signals. In contrast, our mysterious signal is quite persistent and is blinking beyond what's expected for pulsars. So, maybe it's not a typical pulsar, or not a pulsar at all. There's also a magnetar theory. Now, a magnetar is another type of neutron star. They're like supercharged versions of pulsars, with even stronger magnetic fields and slightly longer pulsating periods. Maybe this is what causes our signal's intense persistence. However, when we plotted the data, we also realized the signal didn't match the magnetar's vibes either. Magnetars not only send out radio waves, but also powerful X-rays because they're so energetic. But the signal we received was only sending out radio waves. So we figured it's not a pulsar and not a magnetar. The signal's behavior is very strange and suggests an unnatural source. This means there might be something in the universe that scientists haven't fully explored yet. And there is a space object that we don't know much about. The final theory is the so-called dwarf pulsar. Sounds a little dopey to me. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. Now, a dwarf pulsar is like a star that blinks with light flashes, similar to pulsars, but it takes longer for each blink. Usually, white dwarfs are the leftovers from smaller stars. They don't blink because their magnetic field isn't as strong as pulsars. But when a white dwarf becomes pretty hefty, almost the mass of our sun, it gets super dense and starts pulsating with a strong magnetic field, just like pulsars. They have a cool quirk. White dwarfs are made of electrons, not neutrons like pulsars. When these charged electrons start dancing with a magnetic field, they shoot out periodic light flashes, which happen every 100 to 1,000 seconds. As you remember, our signal has a period of 22 minutes. 1,320 seconds. A bit longer than the usual white dwarf pulsars, but it's much closer to the truth. So far, this sounds like the most plausible explanation. But even this theory isn't fully confirmed yet. This just shows how much there is in the universe that we're still figuring out. For example, fast radio bursts, another mysterious type of signal we've been detecting. They're like quick, intense bursts of energy in the form of radio waves. They have a ton of energy. FRBs are so powerful that sometimes they can be brighter than entire galaxies. Now, imagine this. They release as much energy in a few milliseconds as our sun does in three whole days. Wow! These bursts happen all over the sky with huge frequencies, although some have been detected with lower frequencies. Every day, we catch around 10,000 random FRBs in the sky. Some of them repeat, but most happen once and disappear forever. Unfortunately, most of them only last for a fraction of a second, and by the time their energy reaches us, it's a thousand times weaker than a mobile phone signal from the moon. This is why, despite their brightness, there's still a lot we don't understand about them. We're still trying to figure out what causes these FRBs. They could be coming from different sources, like already mentioned magnetars, colliding stars, or even merging galaxies or white dwarfs. As these bursts travel through space, they pick up information about the cosmic environments they pass through, like interstellar gas clouds. It's very unlikely that FRBs are some messages from extraterrestrial beings, though. Not only because there are thousands of them every day all across the sky, but also because we know that the sources of these bursts must be incredibly energetic themselves. Our neighbors would have to have equipment stronger than entire galaxies for that. But the bottom line is, while all these signals are fascinating, there's still a ton to learn about them. Voyager 1, which has been traveling through interstellar space for more than 45 years and is trailing a long gray beard by this time, nah, not really, it suddenly began to send strange signals to Earth. Even more bizarre, there are no signs that the probe has broken or anything. Scientists from NASA are desperately trying to find the reason. So what's happened exactly? First of all, let me tell you a bit more about Voyager 1 and its long, long journey. Voyager 1 is an American space probe, 
Scientists from NASA sent it into space on September 5, 1977. Voyager's goal was to explore the outer planets of our solar system, namely Jupiter and Saturn. Initially, scientists assumed that the mission would take about five years. Haha, <laughs> the joke's on them. The probe exceeded all expectations. Not only did it fulfill its mission, but it's still working, for much longer than expected. Voyager 1 has been wandering around space for more than 45 years. It's hard to estimate what Voyager 1 has done for science. Firstly, it successfully sent a lot of photos of Jupiter and Saturn to Earth. By the way, you can even check out these photos yourself. All of them are published on the NASA website. Thanks to Voyager, we also discovered several new moons of Jupiter and a previously unknown system of its rings. We learned that Jupiter's famous red spot is actually a giant superfast storm. And after leaving Neptune's orbit behind, Voyager also sent a lot of important data about interstellar plasma. So Voyager 1 successfully proved to scientists how useful it was. After that, it happily headed for its next goal, the Kuiper Belt and the heliosphere. The Kuiper Belt is a ring of icy bodies that extends from Neptune to a distance of approximately 50 AU from the Sun. It's kind of similar to the asteroid belt, but about 20 times wider and 100 times heavier. And the heliosphere is an area around the Sun where the pressure of the solar wind is balanced with the pressure of interstellar gas. Yeah, I know, it sounds like some hard scientific stuff. Just keep in mind that this data really helps us understand the universe as a whole. So this is Voyager's last task, to tell us more about interstellar space. The probe has already sent us more than 60 frames for a mosaic of the solar system from a distance of over 4 billion miles from Earth. Scientists use these frames to make a big colored picture. The photo was called the pale blue dot. And you've probably already guessed what that dot is. Yep, that's what our Earth looks like through Voyager's eyes. This photo clearly shows how tiny we really are and how precious and fragile our planet is. But Voyager 1 also has another, even more important mission – to tell other civilizations about us humans. You might have heard about the famous Voyager Golden Records. People created many audio and video files and added them to these records. There are a few sections. The first one contains hello in 55 languages, including ancient and extinct ones. Almost 80% of the recordings are different musical pieces, like Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and Stravinsky. Folk music from different countries and ages, and a bit of the blues, like famous songs by Louis Armstrong and Chuck Berry. The remaining 20% of the recordings contain different human voices, sounds of nature and animals, as well as 116 images encoded as audio signals. There's also recordings of speeches by Kurt Waldheim, a former UN Secretary General, and Jimmy Carter, a former US President. These are just some friendly messages. In addition to the records, scientists also packed a needle for playing them. Don't worry, they also left a simple drawing that showed how to use all this stuff and how to translate the sounds into pictures. They added Earth's coordinates, which they created using a pulsar map. It shows the position of the Sun in the Milky Way. The record was packed in an aluminum case and covered with gold to protect it against radiation and cosmic dust. Carrying this record, Voyager 1 set off on its long journey. And it has already traveled quite a distance, I'd say. Right now, Voyager 1 is 154 astronomical units away from us. That's about 14.5 billion miles. This makes it the most remote human-made object. Initially, this title belonged to the Pioneer 10 mission, but Voyager overtook it in 1998. What a bargain for NASA! It's way beyond its Best Buy date. Voyager 1 is actually so cool that it even overtook its twin brother, Voyager 2, which, by the way, had been sent into space two weeks earlier. Voyager 1 moves at a speed of 9.7 miles per second. That's 35,000 miles per hour. Even the fastest sports car in the world travels at a speed of only 305 miles per hour. So it's hard to imagine the speed of Voyager. Anyway, at the moment, Voyager is heading to the borders of the Oort cloud. That's the name of a hypothetical layer of icy objects surrounding the solar system. Astronomers haven't confirmed its existence yet, but they're almost sure it's there. 
After all, even black holes were only a theory not so long ago. Unfortunately, Voyager 1 won't return back to the solar system. It'll keep in touch with Earth at least until 2025. But eventually, we'll lose the connection with it for good. In 300 years, it'll reach the borders of the Oort cloud. And in 30,000 years, I won't be around then, it'll finally leave the solar system. And if nothing happens to it along the way, in another 10,000 years, Voyager 1 will approach red dwarf star Gliese 445 in the giraffe constellation. In the future, the probe will probably keep wandering around the Milky Way galaxy. And now, let's finally discuss the mysterious signals part. So, what happened? Well, a rather unusual thing. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which monitors and controls both Voyagers, reported this problem in May 2022. Our veteran spacecraft suddenly began sending strange data to Earth. The whole situation puzzles even engineers from NASA. Now, I bet you're thinking, ah, oh, come on, the thing just probably broke down or something. But the truth is that Voyager 1 is totally fine. It works as usual, receives and carries out commands from Earth, and collects and sends scientific data. But the readings of the AACS, which stands for Attitude and Articulation Control Subsystem, don't show what is actually happening to Voyager anymore. This system supports the orientation of the probe in space and helps it keep in touch with Earth. So, basically, the signals mean that the probe's orientation in space is messed up. But scientists claim this is not the case. They know that the source of the antenna signal remains in the same position relative to Earth as planned. The problem hasn't triggered any of the onboard fault protection systems. The probe hasn't even entered safe mode. So what in the world, or universe, is going on? Suzanne Dodd, the head of the project, says that the problem is not actually that unexpected. After all, Voyager 1 is already 45 years old. The expert admits that what's happening to the probe remains a mystery to them. They don't know exactly where the incorrect data is coming from, and it's unclear how this will affect the operation of Voyager. She adds, though, that it's not that surprising, considering that the probe is in interstellar space. There's a very high level of radiation there. No spacecraft has ever reached that point before. Scientists from NASA say they'll keep closely monitoring the data coming from Voyager 1 until they figure out the problem. If they find it, the management team will try to fix it. Otherwise, the team will have to adapt to the new conditions. It might not be enough just to understand the problem, though. It takes as much as 20 hours and 33 minutes to receive the signal from Voyager. And it takes the same amount of time to respond to it. Well, at least the second spacecraft, Voyager 2, is totally fine. Even though it's also currently in interstellar space at a distance of 12 billion miles from Earth. Anyway, we can only wait for news and hope that the problem will be resolved. I actually wonder how much longer can Voyager 1 last? Will it be able to fly to the borders of the Oort cloud in 300 years? What do you think? I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments. Weird, unusual sounds out of nowhere are spreading all over our galaxy, constantly repeating, and it's something we've never heard before. Scientists discovered it in 2020, and it was nothing like any of the other energy signatures they ever studied. Powerful and bright radio signals occurring from time to time, mysteriously disappearing within a day. It doesn't fit the profile of any space body we know. The signal is a bit irritating, and it disappears without a schedule. When scientists tried to match the signal with some other telescopes, it was gone. Low-mass stars sometimes flare up with radio energy, but not here, since they mostly have X-ray counterparts. Very dense collapsed stars, like pulsars and magnetars, are also not a choice. The closest solution they got is a mysterious class of objects we know as the Galactic Center Radio Source, GCRT. It's a radio source that brightens and rapidly glows. It decays near the center of our galaxy and could help us unravel the mysteries of the universe. If you had a flying car that could go up at a speed of 60 miles per hour, you'd only need one hour to get into space. The moon is a little bit farther. 250,000 miles, which is about 10 times the circumference of our planet. 
That means a moon trip would be like taking a tour around the globe and doing it 10 times straight, which would take less than six months. A trip to Pluto would take over 800 years. Proxima b is the closest Earth-like neighbor we have. It's a small rocky world that orbits the closest stellar neighbor of our Sun. It orbits the star's habitable zone, an area that's far enough from any star to have moderate conditions, not too cold and not too hot for liquid water to at least hypothetically exist. If you tried to travel to Proxima b at a speed of 25,000 miles per hour, which is the speed of the Apollo moon rockets, it would take you over 112,000 years to get there. You might not be able to breathe there. No one knows if Proxima b has an atmosphere. Humans explore the universe all the time, but we can only see around 5% of the matter up there. And Albert Einstein was the first one that realized the empty space is not really nothing. The rest we can't see is actually made up of invisible matter, also known as dark matter. It's about 27%. Combined with something called dark energy, which is 68%. If you try to pour water into space, of course, outside of a spacecraft, it would immediately boil away or vaporize. That's because there's no air or air pressure in space. As air pressure lowers, the temperature you'd usually need to boil water at also gets lower. Keeping that in mind, water boils way faster on a mountaintop than, for example, at sea level. There's no air pressure in space, so water could boil at a very low temperature. Scientists believe that there are at least a couple of billion galaxies out there. We don't know the real number, and probably never will, but they tried to calculate it by counting how many galaxies we can see in a pretty small and restricted area of the sky. It may seem as if the universe was filled with stars and a couple of planets here and there, but our home galaxy has at least 100 billion planets. If you fill a balloon with helium and release it, you'll notice it floats very high. It'll go up into the atmosphere, but it won't go into outer space. The higher you go, the thinner the air in our atmosphere gets. Your balloon will rise up until the point where the atmosphere surrounding it has the same weight as the helium inside it. That will happen at approximately a height of 20 miles above the surface. So this is as far as a helium balloon can rise. We don't really know how big the universe is. We can't see its edges, nor do we know if it even has an edge. We use technology to see out to a distance of around 14 billion light years from our planet. This means we can see around 28 billion light years in diameter across, starting with the outermost layer of our atmosphere that ends at around 600 miles above our planet's surface. Although the size of the universe is constantly changing and gets bigger through time. Mercury is closest to the sun, so most people think it's the hottest planet too. Still. Venus is the hottest planet. It's the second planet away from our central star, around 30 million miles farther from the Sun compared to Mercury. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, which is like some sort of a warming blanket that helps maintain the heat coming from the Sun. Venus has an unexpectedly thick atmosphere, around 100 times thicker than the one we have. Its atmosphere doesn't let the heat out. It just keeps it and constantly makes Venus hotter and hotter. Also, it mostly consists of carbon dioxide that freely lets solar energy in. But it's less transparent to lose long wavelength radiations that the warm heated surface emits. The average temperature there is around 875 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt tin. The maximum temperature on its neighbor, Mercury, is 800 degrees Fahrenheit. In maybe two or more billion years, it will be way too hot for life to exist on our precious planet. As the hundreds of millions of years go by, our sun will keep getting hotter and brighter. Eventually, temperatures will be so high, our beautiful oceans will be wiped away. Since they produce 70% of the oxygen we need to survive, there will be no life without them. All of this means that our planet will simply become a vast desert something like Mars is today. Pluto, a very distant used-to-be planet, now dwarf planet, is actually smaller in diameter than the entire US. 
the biggest distance there, from Maine to Northern California, is approximately 2,900 miles, while Pluto is only 1,473 miles across. Pluto is very far, but the edge of our solar system is 1,000 times farther away than this dwarf planet. But astronomers found many space objects orbiting our Sun way farther than Pluto, such as Kuiper Belt objects and trans-Neptunian objects. There's also an Oort comet cloud that goes half a light year from Pluto, also 1,000 times farther. A neutron star is really heavy. Just a teaspoon filled with it would weigh 6 billion tons. Neutron stars are something that remain from huge stars that have run out of fuel. The fading star explodes, and its core falls apart. But, due to gravity, it forms an extremely dense neutron star. These stars typically have a mass of up to three suns. But the radius there is around six miles, because this is one of the densest things in our universe, at least that we know about. The universe has a color, and it averages to be some kind of beige or, as they call it, cosmic latte. It also has its own smell that reminds you of seared steak or hot metal. At least, that's something astronauts floating in space have said. If you want to build a spacesuit, get ready to work really hard. It takes 5,000 hours to make it and will cost you a million dollars. A really good one will have 11 layers of material and weighs about 110 pounds, and it needs to be comfortable. You'll need more space in there, because you grow up to 2 inches when in space. When you're floating around in space, Earth's gravity doesn't have any impact on you. That's why the vertebrae in your spine might expand and relax a little bit. Which means you'll be maybe 3% taller. For 6 feet, it's about 2 extra inches. Oh, don't worry, it's not permanent. As soon as you go down to Earth, you'll shrink back down to your normal size within a couple of months. Space isn't the best option if you want to have a conversation with your friend. Because up there, sound doesn't travel at all. Molecules there are so far apart that sound vibrations can't reach them, which automatically means they can't vibrate, so we can't hear them. Movies are not accurate with this. No one could hear you screaming in space, too. We kind of live inside our sun. The sun is not just that big hot ball of light located 93 million miles away from us. Its outer atmosphere is way bigger. It extends far beyond the surface we can see. Our planet's orbit goes through its tenuous atmosphere. The evidence is when gusts of the solar wind generate the southern and northern lights. That means, in some way, we live inside the sun. Not just us, other planets too, including distant Neptune. The heliosphere, which is what we call the outer solar atmosphere, extends to about 10 billion miles.